Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Stroke and STEMI EMS Education Opportunity. I have Dr. Tritz here, who's going to give a presentation on STEMI centers, um, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, my name is Jim Tritz. I'm one of the cardiologists here in Central Missouri, and what we're going to talk about today is treatment of STEMIs uh, in mid-Missouri and stuff like that. Some of this is going to be a review for some of you, others it isn't. What I like to go over is kind of everybody involved in treating our STEMI patient and why they all play critical roles. Also, happy holidays and want to thank all of our EMS people because as you'll see later uh, in the slide set, how important you are and why. So why don't we start off talking about STEMIs? Okay, the, the, we, the reason I like to go over three big points, um, how, why, and results. So we're going to say why has all this been put in place and how is it put together and kind of what our results are. First, as far as the why and stuff like that, if you look at American Heart data, this is from 2019, it's a little bit behind and stuff like that. But these are the causes of death. Uh, you can see the male and female and stuff like that um, uh, all across the United States. So when you look at them all combined and stuff like that, there's close to a million people. Uh, coronary disease, cardiovascular disease has been the number one killer for many, many years. I think COVID won out about a year ago, but now uh, it's kind of back in its place and cardiovascular is back on top. Okay, so when we look at the number of deaths from cardiovascular disease, um, you can see there's almost a million a year and stuff like that. If we look at the total amount and stuff like that, so there's more cardiac deaths than there is all deaths from all types of cancer uh, across the United States. And you see the, the cost is rather staggering. When we look at myocardial infarctions, again, you can see that about a third of the deaths are, are due to heart attack each year and stuff like that. About a third of the people that are present with a heart attack die from it and stuff like that. The vast majority don't make it to the hospital. So currently we experience an MI about every minute. And like I say, and a death from an MI about every minute as well. But again, things to remember are a third of the people with infarctions die, and the majority of these people die before they ever get to the hospital. When we look at the prevalence, male and female, uh, guys start out in the lead and stuff like that. So guys get their uh, cardiovascular disease manifestations and deaths earlier in life. But you can see by age 60, the ladies start catching up, and by uh, over 80 and stuff like that, um, they're well ahead. Uh, this thought to be to be due to some protective cause of uh, um, hormones. Nobody knows what it is, but you can see that the split kind of happens about the average age of menopause in the United States. Although it's been tried in the past, you know, giving guys hormones does not change that at all. Then again, when we look at the, the preference as far as ladies are getting more and more press. After 1984, the ladies uh, have greater number of deaths than guys. We always talk about breast cancer and, and ladies, but again, if you look at the numbers and stuff, about one in 30 um, will die from breast cancer. I think that number is probably going to be lower now with all the targeted therapies and stuff. It appears to me that um, the death from breast cancer, I think, is going to be decreased. People live longer with it because it can kind of be stopped, not cured, but slowed down. But one in three ladies will die from cardiovascular disease. Uh, when we look at Missouri, how we stand, unfortunately, we're up amongst the tops. Missouri is in the highest quartile. That's probably based upon our genetics somewhat, which is also our lifestyle. Mainly Germans, Eastern Europeans are a big chunk of the people in Missouri and stuff like that. And so tend to be high fat diets, et cetera, from what we eat. I would say just look at your family reunions and stuff like that, what's usually served at that. And around here, it seems to be a plethora of pork steaks and brats and potato salad and all those type of things. So not very heart healthy diets around here. Also too, people here tend to live to be a little bit older. So we have an older population. Okay, so now we're looking at the uh, treatment sequence and these are all the people that are involved in treating an infarction. And you can see it goes from the patient all the way down to the bottom. And all these play very pivotal roles, pivotal roles in trying to treat infarctions and helping these people survive. First of all, as the patients, as you all know that um, time is muscle when it comes to the heart. And so 
we need to see these people as quick as possible. So one thing you can do in your community is talk about education to the patients, because still the average time from onset of symptoms to when they finally call EMS to get help and stuff like that averages two to four hours. And so we know that's uh, the kind of the peak time is nice to be treating these people. So we have to make an effort to educate our public about symptoms of heart attack, et cetera, early recognition so they notify us. Um, the classic one is you have a meal and stuff like that. Grandma doesn't feel well, so what do you say? Go lie down. When they go check on grandma a couple hours later, she's no longer with us. So we have to educate people about having a high level of suspicion. Symptoms are not always elephant on my chest with a pain going down my arm, as you know. A lot of times they're GI symptoms or atypical, but we have to encourage these people to seek mental attention earlier and if it's not a heart attack that's fine they go home and they're fine but if it is um, we're not going to be able to do anything if they're laying in bed or laying on the sofa at home so in your community it's helpful if you have a chance to try to educate the public uh, on uh, symptoms of infarction next is you guys the first responders now we list all these and stuff like that uh, first responders are not only ems but the people on the scene family and friends encourage people to learn mainly BLS. We know this has the highest uh, uh, success rate and stuff like that. Learn about AADs. A lot of places have AEDs anymore. As you know, it's very easy to learn how to operate these things. And that's very important because most people, they don't die from a massive heart attack, causing their heart to just fail. They die from an arrhythmia. They can have a small heart attack, but if it puts them into ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia, we all know that you can't defibrillate them though, then uh, school's gonna be out very, very quickly and stuff like that. So again, try to, if you can't sponsor it or encourage um, the community to become uh, you know, adequate at doing BLS and like I say, why they call for help. And also if there's an AED present, bring that so it can be utilized. Around here, again, a lot of churches, public places, everything, uh, a lot of places all have AED. I think they're down to about uh, three or $4,000 a piece. So actually it's a nice thing to add to any place where you have large gatherings, especially of people at higher risk, which are older people. Next is where you guys play your role. Uh, obviously EMS, they're very, very important to us. And as far as early recognition, uh, actually our EMS system here in Missouri is very, very good. Um, we're very pleased with it and it helps tremendously. You'll see a later, little later on here, um, the difference it makes and stuff like that. But I think you're very well educated on early recognition of symptoms. We get the reports, what you ask them and stuff like that. Uh, as far as I know, we haven't had any problems with squads sending EKGs, uh, uh, transtelephonic or however they come over our system. So we can take a look at them in advance and that's the way we can activate our, our treatment team before you even get here. So continue to do what you're doing. You, know, you do a very good job. Initial treatment, we talked about everybody, if they're having chest pain, let's assume that their heart, probably if they're over 20, and the things that we wanna do is O2, although there's some question how much that helps because most of these people are not hypoxic, but of course, aspirin, IV access, a nitroglycerin, and, and pain relief if you can, because pain um, adds adrenaline surge, which makes things worse. Whoop, sorry. There we go. Oh, I want to say the other thing too here when we get up about the um, the EKG findings. Uh, sometimes I think people are concerned when they bring a people in, someone in for an infarction, and we look at the EKG or whatever, and and it's listed as a false activation. That's not really true. Um, the problem with EKG again, as you notice that there are, as you know, there are types that you can't tell the difference. Things that will mess with your EKG is left bundle branch block. And you're not going to have a prior one to look at and see is that new or older, et cetera. Pacemakers, uh, pericarditis. Pericarditis can be caused by infarction, so you never know with that one. And they present just the same. Stress cardiomyopathy, all these type of things can make the EKG appear to be an acute infarction. Though in the end, we may not find that these people actually have a blockage that needs to be addressed. Uh, FYI, across the nation and stuff like that, the false activation rate, or what I would say, people that go to the cath lab that don't end up having anything done, that runs about 15 to 20%. So about one in five um, are probably not gonna have to have anything corrected. But again, 
you need to err on that side. You need to you'd rather take them to the lab and say, okay, we're all okay, it's something else. Then again, say, oh, it's nothing, have them lay at home and complete their heart attack because then when they get here, there's nothing we can really do. Heart attack, the muscle starts to die immediately and it completes its course within 12 hours. So again, if the average time of a patient letting us know is two to four, you're a third of the way down the road. Okay, and then this is what you guys do too here and stuff. After you bring them in, we try to do uh, recognition. If we don't already have an EKG, which again, that's uncommon. We have EKGs on about everybody. Once in a while, there's some issues there, but we then activate the STEMI, make sure they're on the appropriate therapy and get the cath lab in here. Um, on the next one, you'll see why early activation is very, very important. Um, this is from 2019, but it remains about the same. About half of our STEMIs walk in the door and half of them you bring in the door. And if you look at the numbers and stuff here, we track many things. We track um, time from uh, when they get here, when an EKG is obtained. We like that to be within 10 minutes. Then we talk about the amount of time it takes them to get from the ER to the cath lab. And then the amount of time when they, we first have contact with them to when we inflate the balloon and open up the arteries. We always have the option to give thrombolytic therapy but actually primary PTCA is a preferred option in most patients. It has a higher success rate and a lower complication rate. That's why this whole system was put into place. The TCD was enacted by our legislature, I think in about 2008, and it stands for time critical diagnosis. They picked out several diseases that if identified rapidly and treated at a center that provides specific tools that the patients had better outcome. So as far as heart attack, that refers to patients or uh, hospitals that can perform primary PTCA to open the blocked arteries. You don't have to have bypass on board um, to provide that services. As you're aware, some do that even though they do not have bypass uh, teams in place. Because again, the majority of these people will not need bypass, need to open the infarct artery, and they can be transferred to a, a place that does bypass if need be. But with our techniques and stuff, that's not very often uh, required. So back to why our early recognition and your EKGs are important. If you look at our walk-in cases uh, in, in comparison to the EMS uh, ones where the uh, STEMI is activated, the total times are lower. That uh, The one where they walk in were about 80 minutes. The one where they're brought in by EMS is about 60. So it cuts town time down by about a third. The reason being, again, our cath lab uh, is not in-house, so people have to come in and they live anywhere from minutes to 25 miles away. And so with active, uh, well, sorry, with pre-activation, those people can be alerted as you're on the way, so you and they get here about the same time and it cuts down our time immensely uh, to getting the artery open, which is significant again because time is heart muscle. Uh, we do give uh, uh, thrombolytic therapy uh, mainly for strokes. I think it's been years since we've had to give one for uh, primary PTCA because fortunately when we had multiple infarcts show up at the same time, in the past they have happened uh, during the day where we can pull together another cath lab and another cardiologist to also uh, proceed with primary PTCA. But again, the reason it's so important to get these notified from in field is it cuts down the time immensely. And actually, if you look at PTCA versus thrombolytic therapy, under 60 minutes, they're about equivalent. But again, less bleeding, et cetera, with primary PTCA. Okay, so your options are uh, thrombolytic therapy, primary PTCA, or transfer to a STEMI center. Now, these are the numbers that are recommended. Uh, the TCD was set up to try to get this in place throughout Missouri. And actually by the rules, what it's supposed to be is if, if you are not uh, a center that, pri uh, that can provide primary PTCA and there is one um, within 30 miles that they should be transferred there. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you can, then it's done at that, safe, that site. Now, the only problem about this, when you look at transferred to STEMI uh, centers, sometimes that's a little bit complicated because you feel that we can get them there in 30 minutes or we can get them there in 60 minutes. But the problem is sometimes when it involves hel helicopters and stuff like that, weather and all those type of things um, can interfere with you. And actually they, there was a study where they looked at transfer to a STEMI center. I believe it was in Tennessee. 
And even though everything would say they should be able to get someone to the STEMI center and have the artery opened within 120 minutes based upon how far it was away, et cetera, and stuff like that, that was successful in only about half of the patients because loading somebody into a helicopter, et cetera, uh, tends to always take longer than anticipated. But again, these people die mainly from a rhythm and stuff like that. So I always tell people, if you think you're having a heart attack, call the ambulance because they have defibrillators. Most people don't have defibrillators in the back of their car, and that's what will do them in long before they get to the hospital. Okay, so once they get here, who's all involved with this? Well, if you're a cardiologist, then we have our cath lab team, et cetera. They're on call 24-7. Um, if you notified us in advance and everybody's here, we bypass the ER. We don't even stop in the emergency room. We go straight to the cath lab lab to uh, speed the process up. And in the picture here, you see one of our cath labs here. Uh, we have two. So after the arteries revascularized, again, it's going to be primary PTCA um, in nearly all of them. It's, again, it's been years since we had to give thrombolytic therapy. But things that improve survival, uh, beta blockers, dual antiplatelet therapy, which is going to be Plyovix, Prolenta, or uh, one of those type of drugs. Now, some places give it in route, um, the oral medication, stuff like that. The only thing about it is if you look at our times are so short as far as revascularization being around 60 to 80 minutes, most of these drugs do not have time to work when given orally in that short amount of time. And should there be something there that makes us think that they would benefit from more rapid, uh, these are available in an IV form. So mainly what I and the other cardiologists do when they come to the cath lab is when you look at the artery, say if there's a big clot in there or something like that, we can give uh, various forms of these medications uh, in an IV form so they work immediately. And then we switch them over to oral on their way out the cath lab. Long term, again, statin uh, for cholesterol reduction, Statins, regardless of what your cholesterol is, will decrease the risk of recurrent heart attack 30%. Then the other things are modifiable risk factors, weight loss, smoking, and treat hypertension, and to try to get everybody enrolled in rehab. The reason rehab is important is because a lot of these people are afraid to do stuff after infarctions. And they always ask, what can I do? What can I do? Well, it's pretty easy because they exercise in a monitored situation and this is available in some of the local community stuff as well. And so then they aren't afraid, they're monitored, and they tend to make uh, faster progress to return to normal levels of activity and stuff. They actually have uh, improved survival as well. When we, tr we track our patients here, as we have to, did 100% of them at time of discharge are offered cardiac rehab. And of those that are offered it, about 80 to 9% actually enroll and complete the course. The other thing rehab does is not only exercise these people, but the people involved in rehab also monitor blood pressure, check their medications, again, to reinforce uh, taking statins, diet, exercise, all those things, how important they are, and make sure they have follow-up appointments uh, with doctors and other people that are required to continue to help them recover. Uh, even though rehab, usually it's somewhere between oh, 12 to 20 weeks, if they have small infarctions, if they're young, et cetera, often they progress much, much quicker. So even though they enrolled, they don't have to complete the whole thing. And we also have an outpatient thing as well, people that because of work or whatever, they can't make it. We have uh, kind of a do-it-yourself kind of thing they can do at home. And then the way we try to improve each time, all our cases are reviewed internally in various committees. And what we do is we look at the cases and then we try to find ways that we can shorten up the time even more quickly. Sometimes what we'll have is even though we make it within the 90 minute window. We see stuff like, oh, what's been a problem here? Not a problem, it's been an issue at times is EKG. Uh, for some reason, and the ER is seeing, you know, 10 people all at the same time and trying to triage people. So sometimes there's delays of five minutes to get an EKG done. Well, you can solve that by training more people how to do EKGs, having more available and stuff like that. So, so we look at all aspects of this patient care and see if the, even though we're making the guidelines, see if we continue to improve and then make recommendations and follow up to make sure those are improved. That's about it, gang. So the thing I would emphasize, especially for our EMS providers, 
this graph right here. So if you take a look at that, that's why it's so important what you do, that you uh, find out way in advance of us that they're having an infarction. We can get the team assembled, so it decreases the reperfusion time by uh, 20 to 30 percent, which means saves a lot of heart muscle. So keep up the good work. If you have any questions, don't hesitate. Give us a jingle. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Tritz, for that presentation. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out. You can either call, text, um, email, either way, and we will get those questions answered and get back to you as soon as we can. And then next up, we have Dr. Saha, and he is with our teleneurology group, and he's going to talk a little bit about stroke. Um, Dr. Saha, if you would like to share your screen, that way everybody can see it, that would be great. All right, hey, thanks for having me. Can you guys hear me okay? Uh, can you guys hear me? Hello, can you guys hear me? Dr. Saha, are you on? All right, can you guys hear me? Yes, now I can. Okay, hey, sorry, I can uh, can get the mic to work. All right, so you can hear me okay? Yes, absolutely. All right, and you see the slides? All I see right now is the team's background. Team's background, okay. I just see the meeting background is all I see. All right, how's this? Perfect. Okay. All right, so I'll get started. Uh, so this is uh, Dr. Sam Saha. I'm a neurologist with uh, Savaro Teleneurology. Uh, we work with SSM Health and other uh, institutions across the country to provide both acute uh, stroke services uh, in the emergency rooms as well as other hospital services involving uh, inpatient neurology patients. Uh, so I was asked to give you this talk um, to just kind of discuss stroke over, overall, especially in the acute setting. And so the focus of this talk will be mostly uh, what happens basically from uh, when the patient starts having symptoms, uh, when uh, most everyone in the pre-hospital setting encounters a stroke patient, all the way into the emergency room uh, before we make a treatment decision. So it's kind of more of a uh, walk in my shoes um, from when I encounter a patient but also kind of a good overview of um, what other people, both bystanders, uh, EMS, um, you know, first responders uh, do encounter during stroke uh, patients. So um, in any case, I'm just gonna move here. Um, these are the topics. So again, we're gonna go over uh, stroke in general, um, spend a good amount of time on stroke signs and symptoms, um, brush upon some stroke screening tools that I'm sure many of you are all aware about, uh, but also discuss some limitations of them. Um, talk about the stroke activation, so you know, really being how does the emergency department as well as uh, EMS get a neurologist involved as soon as possible. 
I'm um, going to do a couple slides on stroke imaging. Um, this may be something you're familiar with or maybe something you're curious about. So we can just go over what we're looking at and evaluating before we make any treatment decisions. And then briefly just touch upon some treatment options uh, that are available for stroke, uh, mainly uh, thrombolytics as well as mechanical intervention uh, for thrombectomy. Uh, so first, an overview. The definition of stroke is really um, ischemia, a brain attack or brain infarction. Uh, it's due to the lack of blood flow to the brain um, that leads to death of brain cells. Uh, unlike the heart that we talked about, the brain and neurons are extremely sensitive. Uh, so you're losing you know, a couple million uh, every minute, about two million or so uh, brain cells every minute that there's uh, any lack of blood flow. Uh, so it's very easy uh, to lose time uh, even quicker than what happens in a, a MI patient. Um, and on top of that, the, you know, the big picture is nine out of 10 strokes are preventable uh, if we follow secondary stroke prevention, cardiovascular health, uh, and, you know, early recognition to prevent the strokes in the first place. But at the end of the day, um, that does require a lot of education beyond what I can do as a neurologist. Uh, about 800,000 patients uh, a year uh, encounter stroke, and about one quarter of them are recurrent. Uh, which is a scary statistic. So I'd say one out of four people in their lifetime will have a stroke, and then one quarter of those will have multiple strokes. So it's extremely important that uh, we recognize not just the first one, but then any subsequent strokes or TIAs that people encounter. Um, and of strokes in general, 30% are TIAs, or transient ischemic attacks. And, you know, for even if you're familiar, you know, transient ischemic attack is a stroke. Uh, so don't get that terminology mixed up. Um, years ago, we used to think, oh, TIAs are just something that happens and you dodge a bullet. But uh, in reality, it is ongoing ischemia that can put brain cells at jeopardy. It's just that now we have imaging that can reliably define what a stroke is versus TIA. And basically, if you're having symptoms and you know they resolve by the time you get to the MRI scanner, um, that's pretty much a TIA. But that said, um, TIAs are just as serious, if not worse, uh, for patients. Uh, and many times, you know, the patients are you know, seen in the ER urgent care center and, you know, they're sent away or, you know, the patients call after having one to the primary care or after hours clinic and they're told they'll just follow up in the morning. Um, and then lo and behold, within the next couple of days, they have one. So just, again, always an opportunity, even if you encounter somebody after they've had a TIA recently, a good opportunity to educate uh, both patient as well as caregivers. So just breaking down signs versus symptoms, you know, just basic definitions. Signs of uh, stroke or disease are objective, whereas symptoms are typically subjective. Um, and of the signs is objective really to everyone but the patient. So what we clinically see uh, on somebody's face, on somebody's body, that would suggest a stroke versus stroke symptoms may be what we see, but also what a patient might report to you as well, the manifestations. So going over some common and uncommon stroke signs, uh, most everyone's aware uh, stroke can affect somebody's face, arms, limbs on one side of the body. Um, it can cause trouble with uh, language, which is aphasia, trouble with recognition of one side, which is neglect, uh, trouble with somebody's visual fields, so being able to see one half of the world or the other, um, and ataxia, imbalance issues. So one of the many obvious signs that either a patient or a observer can detect uh, common stroke symptoms, on the other hand, are uh, you know, objective things that usually, again, the patient could tell, but somebody else might see something very subtle at first, such as a facial weakness or asymmetry. Um, numbness and tingling, usually that's patient reported. Uh, impaired language, um, unless you speak to somebody, you might not even hear. Um, you know, somebody is having aphasia, uh, so it might be on a phone call, might be on, you know, 911 dispatch, uh, listens to a patient calling in for help patient can't explain themselves immediately, that should be one uh, cardinal symptom, suggesting a stroke. Um, vision changes, again, can be self-reported. Uh, it may be something like, you know, visual field neglect, like somebody just bumping into walls. I hear it all the time where a family member noticing a grandma is just, uh, you know, walking her walker into the wall all the time uh, for the past hour and just doesn't make sense. Um, you know, that could be something sudden and subtle that can suggest a stroke. Um, but less common symptoms are the ones that typically affect the back of the brain, the brain stem and the posterior fossa, as we call it, including the cerebellum. Um, and these can be things like double vision, imbalance, vertigo, headaches, confusion, altered level of consciousness. Um, and again, if you 
see any patient, they may have any one of these symptoms any given day, uh, especially if you do a review assistance and ask them. Uh, but the thing with stroke is it's sudden onset and usually more than one symptom. So basically, if you get any one of these symptoms, especially in conjunction, uh, rapid succession, um, assume that it could be a stroke. Now, other things such as migraines, dehydration, MIs, and all these uh, can also trigger symptoms. But again, uh, what we're looking for is multiple symptoms all at once. And then to a stroke neurologist or just anybody, if you're aware of some stroke syndromes, you'll know how to pair certain signs and symptoms together uh, to suggest what part of the brain might be affected. And so that's what we'll talk about next. The other thing I would like to bring up and uh, maybe interesting uh, to a lot of providers, uh, EMS especially, is stroke mimics and chameleons. So basically akin to a mimic is something that's a non-stroke condition that presents with stroke-like symptoms. Um, so essentially they're false positives. You think it's a stroke, but it turns out to be something else. Um, and so it leads to obviously overdiagnosis of stroke. And again, especially first responders are gonna encounter this more often than not. You don't really have the time or the ability to be able to you know, figure things out. So a lot of times strokes are activated in the field. They come to an ER provider or a neurologist and we say, nope, it's not a stroke. And what is it? And these conditions could be varied. Uh, commonly it's seizures, migraines, uh, people have conversion disorder and functional deficits. They could have renal failure and a UTI and have aphasia. So we encounter it in our day-to-day, -day, and these are ones that really you know, throw us up. But, you know, at the end of the day, I'd rather be called about a false positive and figure it out after the fact than not. You know? So, again, they're typically um, overdiagnosed at some point, but they can be undertreated as well, you know, because, again, if you're called as a stroke and billed as a stroke, we'll start that workup. But it turns out they were seizing, you know, and maybe a little key piece of information could have suggested that. So whenever somebody sees a stroke patient, again, somebody with sudden onset of more than one symptom, um, do ask them extra questions, especially if they have a history of seizures, if they have a history of migraines, if they have a history of some, you know, recurrent infections, for example. That may then lean us a little bit toward the stroke mimics. And especially once we're done uh, ruling out stroke, we can easily jump to the um, actual mimic at hand. Uh, stroke chameleons are tougher because stroke chameleons are actually strokes that look and feel like another condition, but are actually strokes indeed. So these are the dangerous ones. These are the false negatives that trip even neurologists up, um, and they lead to underdiagnosis and delays of care. And typically, in a nutshell, these are going to be conditions that affect blood vessels that are less often affected, such as, again, in that posterior circulation. Um, involved in the brain stem or cerebellum or occipital lobes. Um, and so these are also uh, things to recognize, again, out of the scope of this lecture. But um, nonetheless, just know that, you know, sometimes strokes are hiding there in plain sight. They might not ramp up until after you've seen the patient or come in. So if there's anything that suggests a stroke, again, bottom line is just activate it and we'll figure out the rest. Stroke screening exam tools, I mean, they do vary across the nation, but in general, the faster B fast scales uh, encompassing most of the symptoms and categories uh, that would trigger us to even think of a stroke, you know, balance, eyes, face, arms, speech, and then timing, you know, exactly what time did something start, uh, what time were symptoms noticed, and time to call 911. And that's when, you know, most of you guys would get involved. And then different scales uh, kind of expanding on that, like the fast DD scale, uh, it's become very popular to also help not only diagnose the stroke, but also relatively give a clinical indication as to how serious some, something might be um, to suggest, you know, do we need to get somebody to a higher level of care, like a comprehensive center versus primary stroke center? Again, in the end of the day, rule is get somebody somewhere. With the advent of teleneurology, I can be anywhere, anytime. So it doesn't matter if it's a freestanding ER or a comprehensive center. The faster you can get somebody somewhere, they can be evaluated by a neurologist and the ED physician. Um, that's where we can at least do interventions, um, such as thrombolytics or, you know, ultimately uh, thrombectomies. Um, touching upon the NIHSS stroke scale score, uh, so this is typically what we would do in the emergency department, um, but most anybody's at least heard of it also known as the Cincinnati Stroke Scale um, as part of, you know, uh, BLS and ALS training. Um, and really it's a research scale developed uh, decades ago now of just, you know, when they were doing the TPA trials and stroke trials of how to kind of categorize stroke patients into mild, moderate, severe, severe uh, cases. Um, so while it is uh, valuable and it's 
relatively reproducible, whether it's a stroke neurologist or a med student or even you know to some a lay person that's aware of the stroke scale, you can pretty reliably um, gauge a patient's degree of stroke. And it can also point to certain things, but the limitations people don't realize, it really um, is geared toward uh, what we call left hemispheric strokes. So only one half of the brain and specifically anterior left hemispheric strokes. So it still doesn't uh, heavily weight toward right hemispheric strokes or even those posterior strokes we're talking about. And sometimes you can have strokes like that and miss it all together in the stroke scale. So what I like to impart to people is it's a very effective stroke scale. Not only does it help you know, gauge somebody's awareness of stroke symptoms and signs, but also how to do a quick exam. And that's pretty much it in a nutshell. So if you know a little bit about the NIH and being able to do these screening tests, you know, once you've initially got the information, it does really well. But for those reasons I mentioned, um, there are some limitations, of course. Uh, the VAN scale, there's a couple of different scales that we have, some included in FAST-AD, uh, the VAN is vision, aphasia, and neglect. These suggest more cortical infarcts. Cortical infarcts are typically larger. They can affect multiple areas of the brain, cases of blood clots. Uh, but when something is more cortical, that suggests that a larger blood vessel uh, may be affected. And larger blood vessels are typically affected by occlusions. So basically, if somebody has any number of stroke symptoms and signs, but has either Bayesian aphasia or neglect uh, that's involved, um, that can, you know, pointing to this picture here, that can point to the in, you know, temporal lobe, the frontal lobe, uh, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and depending on the combination of symptoms, plus one of these van scale points uh, can suggest that somebody actually may be having a large vessel occlusion, which often are due to uh, embolic occlusions. So um, again, being able to be aware of, say, the fan scale and any one of these components also helps to tell us that, A, this may be a large vessel stroke, but also kind of points us in the right direction of what to look for, what other symptoms to look for. Uh, so when we probe and we can uh, find out, if, especially if something's on the fence. Um, so at this point, really, we've done our assessments. We've uh, done this pre-hospital, even on arrival got to activate the stroke. And this is one thing that we educate all the time. You know, we're telestroke physicians, we're available on the uh, click, of, click of a dime. All you have to do is recognize and get us activated. And it really helps if you activate it pre-hospital because then we can get the heads up 10, 15, 20 minutes before you're aware. And we've had the time now to at least get prepared, get ready to see the patient. If we know some patient identifiers, we can look in the chart, get their history. And by the time we visualize, that's really all we need to make treatment decisions most of the time. Uh, so at Savaro, our setup is pretty straightforward. Uh, we have one phone number called the one call. And so once the uh, ER provider uh, decides to uh, that this is indeed a stroke, uh, they activate us or once they hear it from the field and they dial the number and immediately gets to a neurologist and our guarantees you will speak directly to a neurologist uh, within 45 seconds uh, because of our lack of call center uh, that we're able to make that direct connection from an ER provider to a neurologist. Um, and that gets media information sharing plus gets us activated so we can get on video, get the hospital EMR set up. We can even access patients' uh, prior records and films and be able to get all that information while the ground team is doing their thing. Um, and uh, again, you all know this, but just key piece of information I like to get, especially at that moment, is patient's name, date of birth, MRN but also those signs and symptoms. Anything that you spot it would be key to communicate to the ER provider so that they can tell me, or if you're still there and want to get on video, uh, feel free to let me know as well. Uh, blood glucose, as you know, uh, could be a stroke mimic, uh, especially if it's too high or too low. So that's a crucial piece of information. And then any of the collateral information that we're able to find both in the field or even after arrival, uh, just a simple telephone number of a family member or family member that's on their way in five minutes uh, letting me know will help me um, be able to contact them and get the collateral information I need while again the ground team is getting what they need to get done. But the bottom line, the rate limiting step with all of that is I need the CT. Uh, just like in you know, cardiology and EDKGs and help uh, determine which what kind of a heart attack is going on for same thing for us. Uh, we need the CT scanner and mainly not just to look for stroke. We don't expect to see anything on CT. We'll go over that. Um, some common misconception is we're using the CT to find the stroke, but that's not the case. If we find the stroke, it's already too late, uh, especially if it's a stroke that's um, you know, already been happening for a while. Uh, so our goal is to make sure that there's not only no stroke, but make sure there's no bleeding. It could be a hemorrhagic stroke, 
or non-ischemic stroke. And um, it could be a brain tumor, for example. And um, that would obviously push us in a different direction. So the rate limiting step is really a CT that takes no more than a minute or two to acquire, uh, no more than another minute to take a look at. Um, now with the advent of uh, technology that we have, uh, both on our computers as well as our smartphones. Um, and really we can make that decision. And especially if we have all the other clinical information up front, I can make a decision to treat within you know, two, three minutes, honestly. Um, so that's why it's so key to get all the other clinical information up front. And then really all I need is physically getting the patient on the CT scanner. So ideally hit the door, get your assessments, making sure you check those the airway and breathing. And if they're stable, get on the CT. And hopefully by the time you're there, uh, I'll also be involved as well. So that brings me to the stroke imaging. Uh, I want to briefly run over, I guess, the primary uh, stroke imaging we're all aware about, the CT head, specifically non-contrast CT head. So basically, you don't need to, you know, uh, we don't need to technically have an IV to get the non-contrast CT head. So even if their IVs aren't ready, at least you can shoot this. And main thing is CT heads are very sensitive to acute bleeding. So if there's any acute bleeding or even some recent bleeding, um, such as, uh, you know, intracranial hemorrhage, um, subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, subdural hemorrhage, this will be able to pick it up really reliably. Um, ischemic stroke, which is more of kind of a bruise on the brain, the topic of this conversation, that may take four to six hours to show up on a CT. So again, what I want to see is not only no bleeding, but I also want to see no stroke. And so if I see those two things, plus I have a suspicion of stroke based on everything I've told, that's enough of a green light to consider somebody for thrombolytics. Um, and then also there's some features on CT that can point us toward these large vessel occlusions that we'll go over. Um, but the, also the main point, like we talked about, is ruling out stroke mimics like you know, brain mass or abscess. Um, and the unfortunate other situation um, is that CT heads are low sensitivity for uh, strokes that are going on early, as well as in that posterior fossa, so in that back of the brain, the cerebellum, the brain stem, the parts that are already have weird and atypical stroke symptoms. Well, unfortunately, CT heads are miss strokes there entirely. You can have a stroke going on there for 12 hours and may not even show up on your non-con CT. Uh, that's where MRI comes in. But again, it's in practicality um, worldwide. It's typically the most practical, cost-effective, and faster to just get a CT head and get what we can. Uh, so here's some examples of CT scans of the head. Um, and um, this kind of goes over the uh, time frames. So if you can see it, uh, there's three uh, images of the same patient. Uh, the first image shows what a CT scan looks like three hours after onset of symptoms. Um, so again, you probably won't even be able to see it just based on this slide, but even me looking at it at the squint and find exactly where the stroke is. Um, the Cliff Notes version, if you look to the three months later, that area on the left side of the image, which is the right side of the brain, that's where the stroke ends up. So if you go back uh, in time, you can see and there's maybe just a slight asymmetry on the uh, patient's first scan um, on one side versus the others. So on the right side of the brain, which is the uh, left side of the screen there, um, there's some early changes where things look a little blurry. And that's all we mean by sulcal effacement or loss of gray white metal. Uh, sometimes you can see a hyperdense sign, which we'll show in a second, that can point toward a blood clot that may be present on one side, but not the other. So those are early changes, very subtle, and usually either a neurologist or a radiologist is the one that picks those up. But within a day, within 24 hours for sure, if there's a stroke going on, you'll see it. And that's what these arrows are pointing toward. Um, again, it's very hazy, but if you compare that right side to the left side, you'll definitely see all those changes I talked about, the blurring and whatnot. But you also see that there may be some swelling at that point. So some edema that forms and that starts pushing over to the good side of the brain. Um, so you may notice those ventricles that are there, the fluid filled uh, black spaces right in the middle of the brain, they start getting a little smaller by way of that stroke or bruise expanding. Uh, so that's what's illustrated in the middle picture. And then two, three months later, it doesn't matter. I don't know if that stroke happened again, 10 years ago or three months ago. In general, that's what the brain looks like after a stroke. Uh, basically, it just becomes a fluid filled cavity. All the neurons that were there uh, took up that space, eventually disintegrate and get broken down. And you're left with just spinal fluid. And so that's really what we see. Uh, after three months and beyond. So again, it's just uh, so much going on and really what I'm 
trying to look at in that first scan is that there's nothing there right now, and that's enough for me to treat so that I can hopefully prevent what happens later. Uh, these are some of the features that, again, I've been referring to um, that are just kind of interesting to look at. Um, one thing you can look at here, uh, the very first image, you can see those eyeballs, so kind of the globes of the eyes on the top. And it's hard to see on the left eyeball, but the one on the right, if you can see the little cornea, that's a little bump on top, you can see how that cornea is looking over to the left, right? And so basically what that tells me, you've all seen gaze deviation, usually both eyes go to one side or the other. You can actually see that gaze deviation when somebody's on the table. And so first thing I look at sometimes is the direction of the eyes. And that can point me not only to is this patient having a stroke or possibly a seizure, but also which direction the stroke may be in. And in general, the eyes point to the direction of the stroke. So if the eyes are pointing to this patient's, um, what we'd say the right side, you know, to the left side, that would suggest a stroke that's going to be affecting the right side of the brain. And so the next image is actually just a, a couple sections uh, up, which shows me that hyperdense signs. So basically, the little sliver where the arrow is, that's very bright white, uh, where there shouldn't be anything bright white. Um, that's a suggestion of a very dense clot that's formed. And because it's dense uh, blood, um, that's what shows up as bright white. And that linear line following along where the artery would be is basically the clot uh, that's in question. So that's the other clue that I look for to not only see if somebody's having a stroke, but also if they may have a large vessel occlusion. Um, swelling, you can see as you scroll up, it's again a little darker, a little blurrier, uh, hypoattenuated tissue, same thing, just kind of that darkness is what it's referring to. Versus chronic, after a stroke that's old, you know, you'll see old infarct, that darkness. Uh, you'll see other changes that are like white matter changes. You'll see atrophy from parts of the brain that have lost volume. So again, CAT scans give a wealth of information within one or two minutes, and it doesn't take too long for a neurologist or radiologist to scan it. So again, just based with that information, that's the icing on the cake I need to go ahead with the treatment plan. Uh, then we'll touch upon CT angiograms. Uh, these are just becoming even more and more popular. They're just easier to acquire, faster to process. They still take a good bulk of time. Uh, they do require contrast, and so therefore we need large bore IVs, uh, you know, in the AC and above to be able to do this effectively. Uh, but this is what we really need to confirm large vessel occlusion. So whether we test patients that have a positive VAN scale or fast CT scale or not, um, you'll see at least about one quarter or more of patients have large vessel occlusions of some sort. Um, so the CT angiograms come into play. They also detect medium vessel occlusions, which are a little further out in the brain. And that nowadays with great interventional techniques, as well as uh, stent retrievers that we have, we're able to go even more aggressively further than ever before to get medium vessel occlusions as well. So again, CT angiograms have been phenomenal and monumental in being able to do that. And by processing them quickly, uh, we're able to detect um, a lot of clots. Aside from that, once the radiologist gets through processing it all, you can find also dissections, vascular malformations, aneurysms. So it's a wealth of information, um, just short of doing an actual angiogram that we can get up front and usually acquire within two, three minutes and process within 10 to 15, depending on the situation. Uh, just a brief look of what a CT angiogram would look like to me once everything is processed. So to get this image does take a little while. Um, the radiology technician has to do a lot of uh, wizardry to be able to eliminate a lot of the artifact and the bone, et cetera. But once they do, you can get a nice, clear 3D image that you can rotate and flip. And also, thanks to uh, technology like Fizz and Rapid AI, we're able to see this all on our phones as well. And uh, oftentimes, it's faster to see it on the phone than it is actually on the computer. Uh, so with this, it's really revolutionized how often we do CTAs. Now, almost any center in America will be doing a CTA as well. But that said, you know, there is a cost to it. There is a radiation, extra contrast load. Um, but in general, the trend is we're getting CTAs on most every patient up front, uh, one way or the other. Uh, by the end of their stay, they're definitely getting a CTA. So it's very important to not only you know, get them to a center where they can do that, but also uh, make sure their IVs are in, if possible, in the field so we can get that done all together. Um, one example, just basically what I showed that hyperdense sign on the regular CT, which is on the left. You can see that corresponding darkness. So just where uh, the hyperdense sign is, is where the blood vessel cuts off. And so there's decreased contrast flow just beyond it. And so that's where that correlates. So 
Um, you can pretty much already tell there's somebody with a large vessel occlusion uh, on that non-con CT, but that CTA illustrates this perfectly. Uh, and it's important because sometimes, even though the hyperdense clot may be there, there may be a clot that's longer in the neck, or there may be a clot that's further up. So um, either way, the CTA does have, have a wealth of information, and that's our next step to be able to send somebody to the angio suite to be able to do a mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, CT perfusion, uh, you may have come across this, and it's becoming, again, more and more available using similar CT scanners, um, just with more processing technology, uh, we're able to acquire um, perfusion maps, which basically tells the difference between part of the brain that's not getting enough uh, blood flow or getting decreased blood volumes. There's less blood volumes there, as well as how fast the contrast is flowing. You can tell us the transit time of a contrast once pushed through your artery, up you know, from your heart all the way up to the brain and back. You can detect all of these parameters and then create color-coded maps that we can look at and determine, even before we can get an MRI or some definitive chance, we can take a look at what parts of the brain are uh, not receiving enough blood or what parts of the brain are receiving blood but just slower than usual. Um, so this is where that rapid and vis come in because not only can they process those earlier images, they can also process the maps together and by crunching the numbers, it can help us. So I thought I would just show you kind of what these look like, these nice pretty colors. These are the summary slides, so it doesn't show all the complexity that happened before. But again, we get this picture within about two, three minutes tops from whether you use rapid or visit the institution. And what it does tell us on the left-hand side, left-hand side and the right-hand side are the same CT scans as different slices. The left-hand side shows in purple the core infarct. So the core infarct is defined as where basically there's already tissue that's lost and it's not coming back. Um, and again, it's a parameter based on how much blood is flowing to there, so typically decreased, how much blood volume there is, and that there's a delayed transit time because of that clot the blood is just not flowing beyond that clot. And it's taking way too long to get to that spot. And so when all those three parameters are met, it shoots out a purple, a picture. Versus the green on the right-hand side suggests kind of the fallout zone, where there's no, there may be, you know, part of that area is purple, you know, per, uh, infarcted completely, but there's a good amount that's still salvageable. And that's what we call the penumbra. So basically the difference, the green minus purple is what we call the penumbra, and, and also the mismatch. On the bottom, you'll see numbers. Um, on the right-hand side, it says 73.9 to 74. And on the left, it says 13.1. So basically, your penumbra here would be 74 minus 13, right? And so that's a decent amount of brain to save. So that parameter also helps us determine, hey, is this brain worth saving by being more aggressive um, by doing a thrombectomy, whether or not we've already given uh, thrombolytic uh, here's another example of now on the left-hand side, you have a core infarct of 37 cc's or milliliters. And on the right, you have something that's 39. So the brain at risk is 39. So that's really saying this pretty much all infarct. And so unfortunately, in this case, most likely it's the patient's been under for six hours or more. And the part of the brain that's already infarcted is pretty much all that was left to save. So this would be a no-go. Uh, when somebody, you know, comes in and determines, you know, can we save this patient? So again, sometimes you can tell based on the time, uh, there are people that are slow responders. So even if they've been last known well for 10 hours, you'd be surprised. They may look like that first guy with a small core and a large penumbra. And usually younger people that don't have a lot of reserve, a lot of collateral, uh, they're going to have this kind of picture, even within hours of a stroke. So again, a lot of factors go into it, but luckily now we have this technology at our fingertips and more and more centers are adopting this technology as well as signing up for services like Viz and Rapid that get this information to the neurologists that need it to make these calls. Um, and so that's what we rely upon now as of 2022. In summary, this kind of puts together the CT, the non-con CT, which is kind of image A and B, the CTA, which is image C, and then the CT perfusion maps all together. And so basically, the CT, I already see the hyperdense sign. Um, image B is the aspect score. So basically, it tells me that there's no areas that are already undergone stroke. The C image shows me that there's complete loss of that blood vessel on that uh, right side of the brain right there. And the maps also correspond. So it tells me that, again, there's no stroke, 
but there's a large area, that green area, that's at risk. So this is a definite go, right? Because there's 153 cc's of brain that can be irreversibly infarcted. Um, so this is the this is what I want to see when somebody comes in. Um, this person would probably have an NIH scale of gosh, uh, at least 15 or more. Um, and uh, this is already everything lines up. They're getting TNK if they're within a window. And on top of that, they're on their way to the NGS suite once we activate uh, that team. Um, MRIs uh, we don't use too often in the acute setting. Sometimes it is uh, good for uh, patients that are on the fence. Uh, if we need a tiebreaker, say the CT scans are not very useful. Sometimes we'll do stat MRIs. Uh, we're using it more and more in wake up stroke protocols that are individualized. Uh, some countries with more nationalized health systems are using a lot more than us. But in general, MRIs are really quick. MRIs can pick up stroke with high sensitivity, high specificity. And on top of that, they can um, tell if somebody's had a stroke within five to 10 minutes. And so the cheat sheet is over here on the right where it says DWI, that brightness there is stroke that can honestly be picked up within 10 minutes or so of a stroke start. It's by the time they've hit the ER doors, if we were able to get an MRI in a perfect world, uh, they would already be able to tell that's the part of the brain that's infarcted. Whereas the flare is another sister image that doesn't show up for about four to six hours, give or take. So what we look for is in a perfect world where you see people getting uh, TNK or TPA after our window of time, which is four and a half hours. What we're looking for is we do a stat MRI and we get a DWI picture that shows a stroke, right? But uh, on the flare image, there's no no stroke yet. So that top, um, top row there. Um, so that would be something that may be worth salvaging versus somebody that has no mismatch. They already have DWI and their flare suggests the stroke has already happened uh, for you know four to six hours or more. Uh, that would be something that's, again, not much to save. Um, so again, in the same vein as the CTs, but definitely with more precision uh, specificity, uh, MRIs can pick up, especially if it's a posterior fossa, so that brain stem cerebellum as well. Uh, just quickly touch upon catheter angiography. So this is what we would do in the cath lab. Um, and once we, you know, determine, depending on who's on the stroke team, whether it's a neuroendovascular surgeon, whether it's a, a radiologist, an interventional radiologist, we would activate them, we'd have access to the images and be able to get to the cath lab, assemble the team, and then be able to get on the table uh, for um, a groin puncture and be able to do a thrombectomy with combination of suction catheters as well as uh, stent treaters to be able to uh, address this. And this is kind of a slide that shows the outcomes. We use the TIGI score, a modified TIGI score. And basically, uh, it shows in a grading scale of what an outcome would look like in these different patients. Uh, TIGI of zero means we went in and we were unable to get that occlusion out. So pretty much you're left with what you started. Um, a TIGI one as kind of just partial perfusion, but you still don't have those distal vessels. And then TIGI two goes into 2A, 2B, 2C even. Um, that tells the degree of how much um, the brain is restored. Versus a TIKI 3, you will see not only that uh, large vessel restored, but even the medium to small vessels distally. Uh, so the TIKI 3 outcome is what we like, but again, it's dependent on the situation. Um, so ultimately, the stroke evaluation treatment it involves all of that. And we do bridge the gap as uh, stroke neurologists, telestroke neurologists. And so again, we get the quick assessment, we visualize the images, we get all the history, and then we are in communication with the team on the ground to be able to decide on those two things. Is somebody getting thrombolytics or not? Is somebody getting intervention or not? And really our options are much more limited than what they have in the cardiology world. We do still give thrombolytics because we don't have better options. And nowadays it's either to neck to place or all to place the next place being the newer one bolus shot versus all the place, which is usually the small bolus and a one hour infusion. Uh, antiplatelet agents uh, still work, um, but again, a longer time to effect, and they're not going to thrombolize or kind of lice up a clot. Um, so they help with stabilization in cases that are outside a you know, thrombolytic window, we still will give loading doses of this, but again, it's meant to hold the fort. It's not going to break up a clot by any means. And then finally, the mechanical thrombectomy, that's kind of gold standard now uh, for the past seven, eight years um, since we've gotten better techniques and better technology to be able to go after this uh, with 
kind of relative precision in terms of picking our patients, the patients that would best be suited for these procedures. And by doing that, it's been a game changer of not only how, how many people we're reducing morbidity and debility with, but also saving lives that patients that would have otherwise gone on to ended up in the ICU and had uh, life support withdrawal. Uh, we were able to really uh, make big impacts to not only the survivors, but uh, also uh, patients that wouldn't have survived uh, without you know, the concerted effort. Um, so with that, I just want to open up for some questions. We kind of did a whirlwind tour, but um, any question is welcome if I can answer them for you. Thank you for that presentation, Dr. Saha. Um, we are sending this out to all of our EMS agencies. So if they come up with any questions, I will be sure to send them on to you. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. All right, and like I said, everybody, if you have any questions for Dr. Saha or Dr. Tritz, you can feel free to either email me, call me, text me. All of my contact information is on the email. Um, and I hope you all have a happy holidays and just let us know if you have any questions or any concerns. Thank you.